Now, in this series of Bible studies, we're going to talk in great detail about one of the greatest books in the Bible, if not the greatest book, and a book, strangely enough, that's very neglected by Bible expositors and Bible teachers, primarily because it is an Old Testament book. But of all the books in the Bible, perhaps the greatest of all is a book back in the wisdom literature called the Book of Job, spelled like Job, and sometimes pronounced that way by people who haven't had too much experience in pronouncing Bible names. But Job is one of the greatest characters in Scripture, and I don't know whether you realize or not the greatness of the man or the book from the testimony of Scriptures themselves. When we talk about the book of Job, we're talking about a book that stands on an equal footing with the book of Romans, the Gospel of John, and the book of the Revelation. Now, this is a very commonly misunderstood and commonly neglected as a truth, because, as I've said before, the book of Job is in the Old Testament. The modern emphasis among the Gentiles has been entirely on the New Testament, and a great neglect of the Old Testament books. One must never forget, however, that the book of Job begins the series of books in the Bible we call wisdom literature. And if a man wants to be wise, the wisdom that cannot be found in a college education can be found in Job, the book of Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. As a man has said who's read these passages many times, in the book of Job we have the unhappy man, in the book of Psalms we have the happy man, in the book of Proverbs we have the wise man, in the book of Ecclesiastes we have the worldly man, and the Song of Solomon the heavenly man. And these books are laid out, these five wisdom books, right in the very middle of your Bible, dead center. The center of your Bible is Psalm 118, verse 8. So right in the middle of your Bible, you have the greatest books written to teach a man wisdom. Now, if there's one thing that a modern Christian needs, I would say that would be it. James said, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth liberally to all men, and abradeth not. Let him ask, and it shall be given him. And what we lack like today in America is plainly wisdom. You don't have to be a genius to see that, the way the government is conducting itself, and the way the land is going. You have Washington, D.C. getting terribly indignant about Watergate after enforcing busing without a vote, enforcing private income taxes without a vote, and many other uh, pieces of political chicanery and political shenanigans that are unworthy of the name of virtue or value, and yet they get terribly excited about a president that cheats, which is rather ludicrous when you think about it. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, knowledge is what a man knows. Wisdom is his ability to apply what he knows, and understanding is the man knowing the relationship of his knowledge and wisdom to God. For example, even a superficial reader of the Bible would quickly gather that the devil has knowledge and wisdom. There's no doubt about it. If knowledge alone is worthwhile gaining, like the National Education Association says, the devil is certainly the best person in the world. He has the knowledge. If it's just a matter of knowledge and wisdom, like Solomon had, then the devil still is top-ranking. He was created perfect in wisdom and beauty. The devil has the knowledge, the facts. He knows how to apply what he knows, the wisdom, but the Bible says God at the him of understanding. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and by understanding, men depart from evil. So knowledge and wisdom within themselves are no good unless they are accompanied by understanding. However, the modern generation we're living in has knowledge or no knowledge, and no wisdom, and no understanding. What they are missing is to be found in the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, which begins with our book, the book of Job. Now, I don't know whether you realize it or not, when the, but when the Lord who wrote the Bible, and if you believe the Bible is the Word of God, you believe that, when the Lord wrote His book, and the Bible caused the book of remembrance to be written, according to Malachi chapter 3, when the Lord wrote His book, and the Scriptures say that they are from the Lord and profess to be, and prove it by their intrinsic authority and their power to prophesy, when the Lord wrote his book, do you know what three men he picked out to be the outstanding men of the Old Testament when the Old Testament was nearly complete? Of all those characters you read about in your Bible, the mighty David, the great warrior of God, Solomon, the wise man, Joseph, a type of Christ in 152 particulars, Abraham, the friend of God, 
Do you know what three men God picked out? In Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20, the Holy Spirit has recorded that God's estimation of virtue and goodness in men is to be founded in three characters in the Old Testament. And these men were not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were not David and Solomon and Joshua and Saul, nor were they Gideon or Enoch or Judah. Do you know who they were? I bet if you ask that question to any 35,000 Bible students graduating from Christian colleges, there wouldn't be 10 students who could answer the question. In Ezekiel 14, verse 20, and Ezekiel is an exilic prophet prophesying to the captivity after the time of Nebuchadnezzar, that is, after 586 B.C., Ezekiel, whose prophecy stretched from about, oh, about uh, 600 B.C., on through to about uh, 550 or 540 B.C., Ezekiel says in chapter 14, verse 20, that God's estimation of real class and real character is to be found in three men. Those three men given are Noah, Job, and Daniel. Now that should be a revelation to the student of the New Testament who is interested in what constitutes a godly character in God's sight. These three men, appropriately enough, overcame the world, the flesh, and the devil in their particular spheres and their particular ministries. If you read the accounts, you know that Noah overcame the world, that Daniel overcame the flesh, and Job overcame the devil. And in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20, the Lord said, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. When God wants to speak of a righteous character in the Old Testament, he picks out three men. And the third man is the man we're interested in here today. Noah, Daniel, and Job. Now there's another reason why the book of Job should be in the Christian library, the 66, right alongside such books as Romans, Corinthians, Acts, and Matthew, and the Gospel of John. Do you realize the lessons that are taught in the book of Job are all New Testament lessons? For example, the main lessons taught in the 42 chapters of Job are these. First of all, all they who live godly shall suffer persecution. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And although Job was not in Christ Jesus, he was godly and lived a godly life, and he suffered did you know that's a great lesson for a New Testament Christian to learn? The second great lesson in the book of Job is that God uses Satan to glorify himself. That's a great lesson for a child of God to learn. When Paul speaks about not being ignorant of Satan's devices, and Paul speaks about Satan being transformed into an angel of light, and Paul speaks about coming to the uh, Romans, but uh, Satan hindered him from coming. When Paul speaks about a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet him, he's in line with the first book in the Bible, the book that is older than the book of Genesis, the book of Job, which teaches that God uses Satan to glorify himself. The third great lesson in the book of Job is that all men are sinners. You couldn't find the New Testament doctrine of depravity uh, pictured any better than in the book of Job. Here is a man who was a godly man. When we get to chapter 31, we'll see just how godly he was, certainly more godly than any great Christian leader since his time. And we'll see this when we get to Job chapter 31. Here is a man who is as godly and dedicated as a man could be, and yet before Satan is through with this man, he is complaining and griping against God and pitting his righteousness against the righteousness of God. The third great lesson we learn from the book of Job is that there are some things that are unexplainable apart from revelation. That's a lesson that not one unsaved college professor in America has ever learned. As a matter of fact, the English school of deism that was raised up to overthrow the word of God was raised on the shaky foundation that all a man needed to know about God could be found in nature and man needed no special revelation apart from nature to understand God, and that therefore all the religions of the world could get together 
on the unsure foundation that they agreed on four or five things that anybody could find out in nature. Now, if you will learn one great lesson from the book of Job, you learn lesson number three. There are some things that are unexplainable apart from special revelation. If God had not supernaturally revealed to Job at the end of this book his condition, he never could have possibly discovered it. As a matter of fact, Satan and Job, or Satan and God, work in so close a conjunction, so closely together, that we're told that when David numbered Israel in one account, that God moved him to do it, and the other account, we're told that Satan provoked him to do it. Now, when we speak about these things, we're getting down to the great supernatural realm that the unsaved scientist or educator or religious sacrament, a sacramentalist knows nothing about. When we deal with these things here, we're dealing with the spirit world. We're not dealing with the spiritism and the faked up hallucinations of gurus and the sadistic perversions of Moonies and Ramakrishnas and Keldas and people uh, blundering around and stumbling around the darkness of their deluded imaginations. We're talking about real activities that take place in the world that you have no access to except by special revelation. And this, of course, is where the unsaved world rejects the Bible post-haste as quickly as they can, thumbs down it, gets out of it, because the unsaved world is guided and led by the God of this world, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, who is the prince of the powers of darkness, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, and he is one of the subjects of special revelation in the book of Job. As a matter of fact, the first two chapters of the book of Job show how he operates. And Paul said, we are not ignorant of his devices. But the same type of writer, speaking of the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in Revelation chapter 12, said, He deceiveth the whole world. So the third lesson we learn from the book of Job is a lesson that no New Testament a Christian can escape learning and can avoid learning unless at the peril of his testimony and his life and his character and his rewards. There are some things that are unexplained apart from special revelation. And without the special revelation of God in the spirit world, uh, the dealings we're going to talk about in the book of Job, you cannot explain many things that happen in your life and the life of others. For example, a man that doesn't believe in a literal hell and everlasting punishment and a literal heaven and everlasting glory cannot explain why the righteous suffer. There is no earthly explanation. Once you leave out the salient fact that there are eternal consequences involved and eternal rewards involved and eternal punishments involved, you cannot explain what goes on. You can't explain how bad men get away with sin year after year after year, which many of them do. This is discussed in the book of Job. You can't explain why good people get it in the neck coming and going right and left day and night till they're almost beaten to pieces. You can't explain it from a natural standpoint. You can't uh, stick out your little turkey chest and flip your little peacock feathers around and say, well, it's just a lack of education or a lack of scientific endeavor or a lack of discovery. That won't do. There are millions of people while I'm talking to you over this microphone right now who are suffering from disease they'll never get cured of, and if you had the cure, they couldn't afford it because it was a money job. While I'm talking to you over this microphone, there are thousands of people literally starving to death. A couple of thousand of them will starve before daybreak tomorrow morning. Explain it. You say, well, it's man's trouble. If man keeps on with his endeavors, he'll finally bring in the kingdom. We know the nonsense. Some of us have lived through a couple of wars. We know the nonsense that the men have been carrying on, this foolishness they've been carrying on since uh, Cain knocked Abel's brains out. Don't kid us. Go kid your grandmother. A man said, war is God's judgment on sin here, and hell is God's judgment on sin hereafter. And the further we get in the book of Job, the more we realize that apart from special revelation, there are some things you cannot understand, you cannot explain, and believe me when it comes to explaining them and understanding them, Socrates, Plato, Anaximenes, Anaximander, Einstein, Darwin, Lyle, Huxley, Voltaire, Rousseau, Mach, Kierkegaard, Tillich, Barth, Brunner, 
Hegel, Spinoza, Joyce could no more explain them than you can. They're explained in the book of Job, written more than 1,800 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and more than 2,900 years before Columbus knew a boat from a peanut. The fourth great lesson we learn from the book of Job is that only one sin will damn a man, and that's the sin of self-righteousness. If there's anything clear in the book of Job, this is clear. Job was one of the finest men that ever lived. God speaks highly of him. At the end of the book, he said, Job spoke the thing that was right of me. He likens him to Daniel and Noah as one of the three great men of the Old Testament. And yet when we get to the end of the book of Job, we'll see that Job's sin was self-righteousness. And the Lord held it against him. And finally we see that God is loving and merciful to any sinner who forsakes his self-righteousness. Now these are New Testament lessons found in the book of Job and pictured in the book of Job as clearly as they're found in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. If ever a man had a right to be self-righteous, Job did. And we'll see that when we get to chapter 31. If you're talking about personal righteousness, Job was superior to the Apostle Paul. For example, Paul had the indwelling Holy Spirit. Job did not. Paul had a completed Old Testament revelation. Job had none. And what is further and even more significant is the fact that Paul was a single man and never had to raise a family. Job had a wife who, like the wife of John Wesley, was nothing but a hindrance to him, and he had ten children. And there's no man listening to my voice who's ever had a wife and children who doesn't know that the load placed on a man is greater than the load placed on a single man. If you want to know about the swinging singles and the gay lib and the, the women's lib and all this stuff, all you're dealing with is a bunch of irresponsible children who never grew up and they don't want to be loaded down with other children because they've never grown up themselves. That's the middle and the both ends of it. I hear people talking these days about getting rid of the grading system in the school. Do you know why that is? So some of you won't show up for the punks you are. That's why that is. So some of you lazy loafers can slip by without getting detected. Don't kid the old timers. Don't kid the ones that went around and saw how it went out. And like old uh, Job said to his comforters, he said, uh, many like things. He said, uh, I know too. You're not... He said, we're not in fear to you. What you know, we know too. We know how it goes. We know the course of the age. This man had a wife and ten children. Did you know that's a lot of responsibility? Did you know back in 1940, your tax exemptions for a child back in 1940 were $600? Do you know where the price of milk and chocolate has gone since 1940? Do you know where the price of automobiles has gone since 1940? Do you know where the price of houses and lands have gone since 1940? Do you know where your tax exemptions for children have gone since 1940? <laughs> Imagine the president talking about taking the weight off you by giving you a rebate. Isn't, isn't that funny? You know some folks are downright humorous, you know that. Why not just make the tax exemptions $1,800 a child? I mean, everything else went up 300%. You're paying 50 cents for a dime Hershey bar. That's 500%. Job had a wife to take care of and ten children. And we learn in this passage, in this lesson, this wonderful book, that Job, with all his righteousness and all his godliness, had to forsake his righteousness and trust God's righteousness. This is New Testament doctrine. Now this brings us to a peculiar turn of events, because here we need to consider the date of the book, and the date of the book is further removed from the New Testament than any book in the entire Bible. Job's companions, if one studies the book carefully, all date around the time of Esau. That is shortly after the time of Abraham, and of course Abraham was a contemporary with Isaac and a contemporary with Jacob for a few years. This means this book is written about 1850 years before Jesus Christ. There's a great deal of argument uh, among the scholars about who wrote the book. The general consensus of opinion seems to be that it was written about the time of Solomon, which is nonsense, or it was written by Moses, which won't work either. And when we get over to the 
latter chapters in the book and get around to Job chapter 31 and 32 and 33, we'll find out who wrote the book, because the author of the book speaks in the first person, and the author of the book was sitting on the ash heap with Job when he talked to him. So the student of the book of Job should be careful to ignore the remarks of Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, and Dumelo, and Matthew Henry, and Adam Clark, and John Peter Lang, and the pulpit commentary, and Delich, and Jacinius, and the other 300 so-called conservatives who don't believe what they read. The author of the book is Elihu, which will be very apparent when we get over into chapter 34 and chapter 33. The book of Job has 42 chapters. The book of Job has 1,070 verses, 10,102 words. And the book of Job is one of the greatest books ever written, as we've said before, and of it it has been said by Philip Schaff, the book is without predecessor or rival. Victor Hugo, the great French novelist, said this book is perhaps the greatest masterpiece of the human mind, and English writer Carlyle said nothing has ever been written of equal literary merit. The book of books, then, for the literary man is Job, and Job is a real man. He's mentioned the word of God by James, James chapter 5, verse 11. He's mentioned Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 20, and the book of Job is quoted 60 times in the New Testament. 60 times in the New Testament. The book of Job is quoted. We are dealing here with a real historical character who lived in a real historical place. The book of Job, then, is one of the greatest books of the Bible. It is the book of books to a literary man, saved or lost, and as Carlyle rightly said, there's nothing that Shakespeare or Milton or Tennyson or Thackeray ever wrote that could compare properly with it. We'll see that as we get further into the book. Now, finally... In our first series of lessons on the book of Job, we should notice that the book of Job is such a vast and comprehensive book, such an all-embracing book, that it covers three of the greatest subjects in the entire Bible and covers them with as much material as is found in any other place in the Bible. The main theme of the book of Job is, Why do the righteous suffer? And don't you know the first book that was ever written would deal with this subject? The book of Job was written about 1850 B.C., and Moses doesn't come out of the land of Egypt till 1500 B.C. Since we know that Moses was the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we know the book of Job was written before the book of Genesis was written. Now, this should be a very comforting revelation to the human being who is looking for help in a so-called lonely and isolated and cold universe, uh, controlled by the apathy of the stars. Do you realize when God first began to write, and after all, why wouldn't he write words? You are people, you communicate with words. Why wouldn't God write a book? Don't you know when God first began to write that he didn't write to man primarily about the material universe? Don't you know if there's any God up there at all, and if he revealed himself at all, and I'm giving you atheists and agnostics the benefit of a doubt, although you're not worth it, don't you know that if God communed with man, his creation, which he'd have to, he'd be a pretty sorry God, that he would commune in words? After all, that's the thing that distinguishes man from animals, even if you're a Darwinian. You know any animals that can write a thesis on Beethoven versus Mozart? Somebody said, well, if you train these monkeys 120,000 years, they could write out the works of Shakespeare. Now, you don't believe that. I mean, the typewriters would all wear out. How about the care and maintenance of the monkeys? People get these little hypothetical, hypothetical little ditties picked up, these little hanky-panky things, and try to make big deals out of them. I believe it was Albert Einstein who had one going, when you shave yourself in front of a mirror, traveling at the speed of light, and the light in the mirror wouldn't reach your face, or something like that. Having proved it, you know what he got? He got an atom bomb. <laughs> Checks, doesn't it? Now, you take this book of Job. This book of Job is written at least 200 years before the book of Genesis is written. And when God communes to his creature, whom he made, and whose sorrows he knows and is acquainted with, he didn't waste time in penning the first book on the atomic structure of the protons and the neutrons and the electronic charges. 
He didn't waste five minutes while a hot air about enzymes and amino acids and the peptic code in the chain of the genes. You see, in other words, the Lord who wrote the book certainly had more sense than any five leading scientists you ever met in your life, including you or your friends. And when God wrote that book, he knew the problem that you're going to have to deal with and the problem your son would have to deal with and the problem your grandchildren and great-grandchildren would have to deal with, and that would be suffering, sorrow, sickness, disease, and death. And beside that, the scientists are in the Little League. Somebody said, but look, all these scientists have done to relieve suffering. You mean for those who can afford the medicine? You ever check the hospital price of these days? Who are you trying to kid anyway? You're not talking to some greenhorn. Some of you folks so green, if you got stuck in the ground, you'd root in about 15 minutes. Do you think those of us who've been around the world and up and down and back and forth, do you think we don't know that every scientific advancement made was made for the advantage or the benefit of somebody had enough, who had enough money to afford it? Science is good business. I'll grant you make a living off it. You make a living digging ditches. People are funny, aren't they? Now, when God spoke about these matters of sickness, sorrow, and suffering, and death, he spoke on the great theme of why do the righteous suffer? And after all, that is the main theme of life. As a man said, earth is the place for trusting, heaven is the place for understanding. This world is still a veil of tears, and God sent one man into this world without sin, but that man was, quote, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, the Lord God who made you knew the problem wasn't with your head, it was with your heart. And so the first thing that God ever put on paper and penned was the book of Job. And many, many years before he spent time talking about in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, he dealt with the first major problem that man has always been oppressed with and harassed with and has always been perplexed with, if that isn't a good grammatical construction, the problem of why is it that when people do right and live right and try to please God, they still suffer. And whether the answer to that thing be to make them more sympathetic or to make them more heavenly minded or to make them partakers of God's holiness or to prove to them that God's promises are sure or to prove to them the sufficiency of God, the brutal fact remains that many people suffer for the sins of others, many people suffer because of the wrongdoing and mistakes of others, and hundreds of thousands of people die every year because of the covetousness, wickedness, crookedness, and greediness of thousands of others. Those are the facts of life. And 2,000 years of scientific advancement has never altered anything I said as far as the second hand is from one, when it's at twelve. Now the Schofield note says in the old Schofield reference Bible, this outward world is often imposing in fleets and uh, customs and uh, marketplaces and books and literature and art, and is often imposing religious with outward religious ceremonies and sacraments. But in any time of crisis, real crisis, it is only held together by armed conflict. This world is still this world. And the first problem of this world is not how do the atomic dust clouds form constellations. That's for the kiddies. The first problem is not how to populate Venus or Jupiter or contact the UFOs to set up a world government. That's for the babies. The first problem and foremost is why do the righteous suffer? And this book we're about to study, the great book, the very first book of the Holy Bible, the book of Job, deals with this very important problem. In our next lesson, we'll talk about the three main doctrines the book of Job deals with and then we'll discuss the scientific, philosophical, and prophetic data found in this great book, the book of Job. Bring this to our second study on the book of Job, one of the great books of the Word of God, if not the very greatest. On our previous lesson, we learned about the authorship of the book. We studied the main statistics to deal with the book of Job. We talked about the date of the writing of the book and what others had to say about the book. On this second lesson, 
we need to first examine the great doctrine that's pictured by the book of Job. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but the book of Job deals doctrinally with three of the most important subjects of Scripture. First of all, the great tribulation. Secondly, the sufferings of Christ. And thirdly, the condition of a sinner in hell. Now we'll talk about these one at a time. First of all, in the book of Job, we have one of the clearest pictures of the great tribulation anywhere in the Word of God. Prophetic students who talk about Daniel's 70th week are often hung up on Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, often talking about the sign of the times in Matthew chapter 24, and entirely neglecting to tell the reader or the listener that the greatest book in the Bible and the great tribulation is not Daniel or Revelation, it's Job. Now, the book of Job pictures the suffering of the tribulation saint. It also pictures the judgment of the Antichrist and the judgment on the wicked during the tribulation. And nowhere is this pictured any better than the closing chapters of the book of Job, which we'll talk about in some detail on later lessons. But first of all, observe the marvelous phenomena preserved in the King James Bible, which is unavailable in the originals. As you know, the Hebrew manuscripts had no... Uh, chapter divisions as such, although they had parashahs, uh, paragraph divisions. The King James Bible has preserved a most remarkable phenomenon in the order of books and the chapter numberings, which if you had the originals, you could not find. There are many ways in which the authorized version is superior to the originals, <coughs> which is very apparent to the student who studies the Greek New Testament. For example, in the Greek New Testament, the block capital unsealed letters of the Greek manuscripts are written together so that you cannot divide them uh, apart by commas, semicolons, periods, and anything else. But in the authorized version, they're not divided, but put down into chapter verses for easy memorization. The man who breaks the chapter and verse division of the Bible has caused the student to lose cross-references, and the man who adopts some other version of the King James for study has broken its ability to uh, reinforce itself on the mind of the reader by memorization. Uh, David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. The new Bibles are not poetic. They're written in prose. They don't lend themselves to memorization. Now, in the book of Job, we have a most remarkable phenomena. In the first place, the Hebrew Scriptures, as laid out in the Hebrew Bible, come in three divisions, called the Torah, the Navim, and the Kethubim, the Law, and the Prophets, and the Writings. Job occurs at the end of the Hebrew Old Testament as one of the Writings, following the Prophets. But notice the remarkable phenomena in the placing of the book of Job in a King James 1611 authorized version, which all the new Bibles have to follow. Notice, please... Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. Now consider, in the book of Ezra, the Jews return to Palestine, as they did in 1948. In Nehemiah, they begin to rebuild, as they're doing in 1978. In Esther, there's a scene in the king's palace where a marriage is going on and a wedding feast for seven days and seven nights. And while this is taking place up in glory, Job is down on the ground seven days and seven nights, Job 2.13, being persecuted by Satan. And at the end of the book of Job, it says, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. That expression, turned the captivity, has been altered in all the new Bibles so you could not find the cross-reference to the restoration of Israel. And if this were the only reason for rejecting the new Bibles, it would be reason enough. But the phenomenon doesn't stop with this. The next book, the book of Psalms, begins with the son of David showing up as the king over all the earth, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Now, how does one explain this? Here is a premillennial order of books found in a Bible whose enemies say, well, it was a high church book. I don't mean it, know many Anglicans that are premillennial. How they connive to set up the order of the books in the premillennial fashion. Now, think about that. 
So many simple Erasmus texts, you know, was a Roman text. You were very much in error. Erasmus text was the Protestant text used by every Protestant reformer in the Reformation. The official text produced by the Romanists was not Erasmus text. It was the text of Cardinal Examines in Spain. I just threw that in there free. Won't charge anything for it. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther deal with the return of Israel, the restoration of Israel, and the rapture. And the book of Job shows what's going on down on this ground while the kings had him the wedding feast upstairs. Now, if you doubted this, did you notice the number of chapters in the book of Job? Set up by the King James Bible, where the other Bibles had to imitate the chapter numbers? There are 42. You students of Bible prophecy, if you've obtained the uh, recordings and cassettes on the book of Revelation from the landmark Baptist temple, uh, or the work on the book of uh, Daniel, don't you know there are 42 months in the Great Tribulation? How do you explain the accidental insertion of 42 chapters in Job? You say it's a coincidence. Let's see if it is. Job is in the land of Uz. Do you know where the land of Uz is? Well, Lamentations chapter 4, 21, it's said to be in the land of Edom. Do you know where Edom is? Why, it's where Sela Petra is, the rock city where the Jews will be in the tribulation. Revelation chapter 12. Remarkable coinky dinky, eh what? He said, well, that's just two of them. No need to stop there. Do you know Job's on the ground seven days and seven nights? Do you know how many years are on the Great Tribulation? Well, the Tribulation is seven years, and the Great Tribulation is 42 months. How do you explain it? You say, accident. You're kind of overdrawing your bank account, aren't you, son? You realize in Job chapter 42 that Job has his children resurrected? Did you know there's a resurrection at the end of the tribulation? Aren't you kind of overdrawing your account? Do you realize right at the end of the book of Job, the Antichrist shows up, and then the Lord shows up immediately afterward to destroy him? How do you explain this kind of thing? You realize in Job chapter 42, it said the Lord turned the captivity of Job, and all the new Bibles have changed that, so you lose the cross-reference to the restoration of Israel. Do you know what the word Job means? It means one persecuted. Do you know who's persecuted in the tribulation? Israel. Do you know they're persecuted by, according to Revelation 12, the devil? Do you know who's persecuting Job? The devil. Do you still have any money left in the account? You know, after a while, it gets kind of funny to watch some of you people. I, I'm not talking to most of you, but some of you people who don't believe the Word of God and turn up your nose at the old authorized version, did you know sometimes you're kind of humorous to some of us folks who spend a little time reading? Do you know that really? I mean, really, if not funny, downright pitiful. Did you know that? The book of Job is a picture of the Great Tribulation, and the placement is in the premillennial position by the King James translators. You'll have a time explaining that one at the judgment seat of Christ, won't you? All right, secondly, the book of Job is a great picture of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. I'll give you the references specifically, and then trust that you'll study them at your leisure. First of all, Job chapter 16, verse 1 to 18. Job 16, verse 1 to 18. Job chapter 17, verse 14. Job chapter 17, verse 14. Job chapter 19, verse 1 to 11. Job chapter 19, verse 1 to 11. And finally, the entire 30th chapter of the book of Job. Job chapter 30. Now, all these references point out to somebody going through excruciating suffering. All these verses point to a man upon whom the wrath of God is being poured and poured out. They picture, in short, the vicarious sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ for sinners, the just suffering for the unjust that he might bring us to God. And they are descriptive of the agonies to which the Lord Jesus Christ went on Calvary's cross. Job 16, 1 to 18, Job 17, 14, Job 19, 1 to 11, and Job chapter 30. 
And now, since the sufferings of Jesus Christ were the vicarious substitutionary sufferings in the place of the sinner, we should not be at all surprised to find that the book of Job is also a tremendous picture of a sinner in hell. Now, we realize this is not a very popular subject today, and when you go to the Youth Dynamic Tension Conferences, the nasty word will not appear. And when you pick up the new Bible, it's been carefully sublimated to the word Hades, so it doesn't upset your ears polite, but rather keep damnation snugly out of sight. But Job is a picture of a sinner suffering in hell. Now notice the verses. Chapter 30, verse 20. Chapter 30, verse 20. Chapter 30, verse 30. Chapter 30, verse 30. The things we find here are descriptive of a man in a pit who is chained and suffering eternal damnation and fire. Job 20, verse 7. Job 20, verse 11. Job 20, verse 26. Job 18, verse 15 to 21. Job 18, verse 15 to 21. Job 18, verse 11 to 14. Job 18, verse 11 to 14. Job 13, verse 24. Job 13, 24. And Job 7, verse 6 to verse 4. Now these pastors, if they're read prayerfully and carefully, will show something to the reader that could not be learned anywhere on, the, on this earth. It shows him the agonies and torment of the damned. This is Job under the wrath of God, the poured out, stretched out wrath of God, suffering. And although Job turns out to be a saint, and although the Lord delivers Job, Job gets a temporary taste of unsheeted hell. And he cries to God and is not heard. He speaks of a chain. He speaks of worms. He's on the city dump. In the New Testament, it's called Gehenna. Ashes, worms, dead bodies, blood, garbage, and fire. Then we have three, three tremendous doctrines covered by the book of Job in the Old Testament. We have verses that deal with the great tribulation throughout the entire book. We have verses that point out the vicarious suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a picture of the self-righteous man who has trusted his own righteousness, suffering in hell for pitting his righteousness against the righteousness of God. And after all, that's what it amounts to. A man said, I don't believe in hell. Well, you have a lot of superstitious nuts around these days. I know a man that doesn't believe in rattlesnakes. I don't know what it amounts to. Little or nothing. And in this book, we have a picture of a man suffering the wrath of God, and as sure as the righteous suffer, the unrighteous will suffer, and as sure as all those that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and Job amply demonstrates this terrible truth. This terrible, negative, disagreeable truth that is so revolting to the depraved heart of the unsaved man, he simply cannot stand it or tolerate it. And as a result, you'll find in 90% of the churches today in America, the word hell is never mentioned, let alone preached about or revealed. We now come to the next great thing about the book of Job, and of course there are many tremendous things about this book. We come to the fact that this book has scientific data in it, and philosophical data, and prophetic material, and New Testament material, that are found in no book in the Old Testament but the book of Job. First of all, the scientific data. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but Harry Rimmer, who died recently, had a Christian Research Foundation set up with an offer of $1,000 to any man who could prove one scientific error in the Word of God. He was taken to court on eight counts by the plaintiff, and all the counts were dismissed and thrown out of court. Now, I realize everybody is very familiar with the monkey trials in Dayton, Tennessee, where William Jennings Bryant tried unsuccessfully to put Clarence Dallow in the box, and the Civil Liberties Union, who's always been out to convert America to communism, had a good bit to say. Uh, although William Jennings Bryant was a very godly man, a man who loved the Lord and believed the book, he was no match for the shrewd mind of Clarence Darrow. Therefore, that trial received a great deal of publicity as an example of a Bible believer up against an educated man. This shows the depravity of the Associated Press. The great trial that took place uh, in New York, 
where Harry Rimmer was taken to court on eight occasions to prove the Bible against the complaint, the plaintiff who professed to have found a scientific error in it, was thrown out on eight counts. And if the plaintiff would prove his case, he would have $8,000 in his pocket. They were, by the way, taken to court under a Jewish uh, judge who was a liberal Jew and didn't even believe the Old Testament. There's a standing offer of $1,000. Anybody who can find a scientific error in the Word of God and prove it in court, you can do it. You said, now, Dr. Ruckman, how do you know who's listening to this tape or this cassette? I could care less. I know you couldn't if you're here sitting opposite me, so why would I waste time with you? I've talked with these brilliant intellects and these PhDs and these MAs and these boys that talk about the original language. I've talked with them. I've dealt with them. I've had dealing with them. There's no man talking to me right now who can prove one scientific error in the Word of God in court. You couldn't if you tried. And if you want to try, contact the Christian Research Foundation and collect your money. Like this out in the world, put up or shut up. All right, in Job chapter 38, in Job chapter 38, you have scientific data that is found written in print and recorded for you hundreds and hundreds of years before Galileo and Kepler and Copernicus knew what it was all about. We'll talk about these matters more when we get to Job chapter 38. But in Job chapter 38, a high rumor put about 20 scientists to the test one night on that chapter and asked them the questions they, that were asked Job. And of those scientists, there wasn't one man there that got all the questions. I think of a possible score of 100, the smartest man there got about 75 or 80. You understand in a book written 1,800 years B.C. The next thing we find in the book of Job, which is remarkable, is the philosophical data. Anybody who has spent any amount of time in the book of Job, the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon, the wisdom literature, realize there's nothing the Greeks had to contribute to this matter at the time of 400 B.C. that was not already written. Any man who spent a great deal of time in Ecclesiastes, Job, and Proverbs knows the true evaluation to be placed upon Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Epicurus, Zeno, and the girls at Athens. What the Greeks call wisdom, that Paul said the Greeks seek after wisdom, was foolishness. And when these Greeks took over in 400 B.C. and 300 B.C., they had available in their language and around the world the writings of Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, and Solomon was not a Greek. So when we come to the book of Job, we find philosophical material that is at least, at a minimum, a minimum of a millennium before the time of the Greek philosophers, that is a minimum of uh, 1,300 years before Plato had the syrup taken out of his baby formula. A good example of this can be found in the book of Job in dealing with the matters of life. Notice, for example, in Job chapter 7, we'll point out the verses, the verses that tell a man what life is like. If a man wants to know what is life like, what is life, he doesn't have to pick up Life magazine to learn anything. All he has to do is pick up the book of Job. If a man wants to know what life is like, but no use trying to pattern it after his own image and say, well, it's just a matter of relative meaningful relationships and what's for me is not for you and what's you, all that stuff. You know the communist line. What's for you is not for me and what's for me is not for all that stuff, you know. I mean, you know how they break down the educational system to make rebels out of your children. We're not talking about that right now. The point is, if you want to know what life is like, turn to Job and look what you find here. Job 7, verse 1. Life is like a servitude. Job 7, verse 9, life is like a cloud. Job 7, verse 6, life is like a weaver's shuttle. Verse 7, life is like wind. Verse 18, life is a trial. Chapter 8, verse 9, life is a shadow. Chapter 9, 25, life is like a racehorse. 926, life is like an eagle's flight. 926, life is like a swift boat. Job 1325, life is like a wind-blown leaf. Chapter 14, verse 10, life is like a rotten tree. 
Job 14, verse 1, life is like a flower. And finally, life is like a fireplace, for man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job chapter 5, verse 7. Now these similitudes used by the Holy Spirit and recorded eternally for man to read tell man all he needs to know about life. And if there's one particular thing we find that matches these verses, if there's one characteristic or one quality which all of these similitudes have, the weaver's shuttle, the wind, the servitude, the trial, the shadow, the racehorse, the eagle's flight, the swift boat, the wind-blown leaf, the rotten tree, the flower, it is the fact that they come and go quickly. Or as a man said, a watch doesn't go tick, 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 tick. A watch goes quick, 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 quick. Samuel Johnson had engraved upon his watch, work. For the night cometh when no man can work. David said life is like a hand's breadth. James said it's like a vapor that appears for a while and then vanishes away. These are the divine estimations of life. This is the divine evaluation of life. And what you think life is like, and what your professors think it's like, are not to be compared with this authentic, absolute, infallible definition given by the Holy Spirit 1,800 years before Jesus Christ was born in a manger. And don't you know the author of life would not fail to give you a few choice words about life? If God is life, and Him is the life of man, and He gave you physical life, do you think He'd waste time at the beginning writing a book on the constellations and the solar system and the alpha rays and the beta rays and the actinic rays, and waste his time talking to you about supersonic sounds and speeds? Do you think he'd waste time with that tripe? The first thing he'd do is tell you what life was all about and what it was like, and these similitudes are found in the classic book of Job. All right, next. The book of Job contains prophetic material almost beyond the grasp of the mind. All of Job chapter 40, 41, and 42 is prophecy. And if you read the book of Job carefully, you'll find the Antichrist popping up clear through it. You'll find troop movements in Edom popping up in Job chapter 6. And you'll find the rapture as clearly as you ever find it in your life in Job 37 and the judgment seat of Christ in Job 26. The book is filled with prophetic material. And finally, and I'll give you the references slowly so you can write them down for future study, the book is filled with New Testament doctrine. Here is a book given long before the law was given. Here is a book that was completed before Moses was born. Here is a book that was written before Moses penned Genesis. And if you ever saw grace manifest and New Testament salvation manifest, you'll find it in the book of Job. I'll give you the references. These are the references that point out the New Testament material found in the book of Job. Job 4, verse 17. Job 4, verse 17. Job 5, verse 17. Job 5, verse 17. Job 9, verse 20. Job 9, verse 20. Job 9, verse 33. Job 9, 33. Job 11, verse 4 to 5. 11, 4 to 5. Job 14, verse 4. Job 14, verse 4, Job 16, verse 11 to 18, Job 16, verse 11 to 18, Job 19, 25, Job 19, 25, Job 23, 12, 23, 12, Job 25, 4, 25, 4, Job 32, 8, Job 32, 8, and especially Job chapter 40, verse 1 to 14. Job 40, verse 1 to 14. Now there isn't time in a brief series of studies like this to go into all this material, although in our next two lessons we'll begin the book of Job verse by verse and cover the uh, major doctrines found therein. However, these verses I've just given you, talking about the New Testament material in the book of Job, deal with the crucifixion, the resurrection, the intercession of Christ, the condition of the sinner, 
the need for perfect righteousness, the inability of self-righteousness to save, the righteousness of God manifest, the plan of salvation manifest, the rescue and redemption of the Holy Spirit manifest. The entire thing is found in Job. And I don't mean Romans. Now, Romans is a great book, and it presents for us the New Testament doctrines of Pauline salvation. But if you think for a minute that your study as a Christian is to be confined to New Testament books, you didn't read all of Romans very carefully. In Romans 15, as we commented in our previous lessons in the book of Romans, which you can obtain from the uh, landmark Baptist temple, we mentioned the fact there that the Old Testament scriptures were written for our learning. So Job is for our learning, and we can learn much from the book of Job. Now, finally, on this second lesson, we need to notice a negative thing. The LXX, so-called, that is, the Greek manuscripts in the Atticus and Vaticanus, have the Old Testament in Greek as well as the New Testament in Greek. This is the mythological Septuagint you hear the scholars talk about. And anybody knows that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were written 300 years after the death of Jesus Christ. But they were Greek translations of the Old Testament made after the resurrection. The LXX has added 15 words at the end of the book of Job. And strangely enough, the New Bibles, like the New ASV and the International Bible, have refused to print these 15 extra words, although they're found. They are so obviously spurious that the New Bibles did not dare print them although they are in the manuscripts used to correct your King James Bible with. Now, the serious student of the Word of God who is sincere and dedicated and conscientious should never waste time in dealing with hypocritical work like this. Where a man has altered the King James text 36,000 times in the Old and New Testament, and yet does not have enough nerve to translate the part of his manuscripts that are obviously apocryphal, showing his lack of faith in them, he had no business using them to start with. These are often called the best and oldest manuscripts, but they are so corrupt, their own worshipers don't even dare translate them. And this reminds us to say that the new translations have done the greatest damage possible by altering the verses that I have just listed, thereby covering up knowledge and concealing knowledge from the student of the Word of God. I have listed now on these two opening lessons more than 30 verses of Scripture. Any Bible that has changed any one of these new verses has covered up a cross-reference or obliterated a reference to biblical truth. I would suggest, therefore, that in your studying of the book of Job, you stick by the authorized text where truth is clearly set forth and clearly presented and spoken so plainly that a wayfaring man, though a fool, may not err therein. On our next lesson, we shall take up a verse-by-verse -verse study of the text of the book of Job.